please open your Bibles with me to Ephesians 5. We're going to be reading Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 33 today. Please stand as we hear the holy word of the Lord. Ephesians 5, 22 through 33. Hear the word of the Lord. Wives, submit yourself to your own husband as you do for the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does for the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. This is the word of the Lord today. Please have a seat. In my career as a minister, I have performed probably around 20 marriages to date. And out of all 20 of those, I have never once had a couple come up to me and say, Pastor, we would really like to to read or have you preach on this passage here from Ephesians 5. Not once. Can you imagine that? Why? Because our modern culture finds verses 22 through 24 to be deeply offensive. Maybe you do too. Maybe we read this this morning and you were wincing already. You're going, oh, can't we just leapfrog right, right over those verses? But you know, that's not what we do here. So I find that couples kind of throw out in a knee-jerk reaction one of the most profoundly beautiful passages on Christian marriage in the Bible. We just toss this whole passage out because our knee-jerk reaction is we find this offensive. Now, let's, let's address the elephant in the room. Let's be frank here. These verses have been used, very much so, to subjugate and abuse women. And this is, this is a lot where our hesitation comes from. Men have looked at these verses, they have interpreted them as giving them free reign to be tyrants in their own home, to rule with a fist, to make sure that they, they strip their wives of all, uh, of all rights, and they can boss them around like they're their little slave. So let's be very clear from the onset. That interpretation of these verses is not, nor has ever been, what Paul intended. That is not what the Bible says about marriage here or elsewhere, and so we need to be very careful about that. But in fact, Paul, believe it or not, is striking back in this passage against the abuse of marriage that he saw in his his civilization all around him. In Roman and Greek culture of that time, marriage was more often than not just a kind of formal contractual uh, relationship that people would get into to have kids. If you really wanted love, if you wanted pleasure, you had your concubines, you had your courtesans on the side. That was what you had for your real relationships. You just got into your marriage if you maybe wanted a kid someday for social status. So Paul was striking out against that. He saw adultery was just everywhere. The divorce rate was incredible. People were being abused, both men and women, but especially women. One ancient writer in the first century said this, Husbands aim to see as little of their wives as possible, hear as little of them as possible, and deal with them as little of them as possible. You know the philosopher Socrates? Socrates uh, wrote that no husband, no sane husband, would ever entrust serious matters to his wife. But here in Ephesians 5, 
Paul goes against this conviction. He bucks the trend, and he holds up this beautiful model of how a loving, supportive, and functional marriage operates. He said, this is our standard. Forget what the world is doing. This is what God wants for you. He says, both this, this applies to both your marriage between a man and a woman and the marriage, the union, between Christ and the church. Marriage is a beautiful parallel for to help us understand our relationship with God. So if you're sitting there going, well, this passage doesn't apply to me, I'm not married, this does apply to you because you have a union with Christ. So I want you to pay attention no matter what your relationship status might be on Facebook. So as we look at these verses today, as you still might have this knee-jerk reaction against these verses, give me 20 minutes. Give me some time. Push aside your preconceptions. Let's really look at what God is saying about marriage here because I think I can change your mind. So let's look at that today in both our relationship with our spouse and our relationship with Jesus. So we need to start our examination of these verses by going way back to look at the world's very first marriage. Looking at Genesis chapter 2. If you got your Bible, you can flip that open. If, you, if not, that's okay. In Genesis 2, God creates man. He creates a man known as Adam. He creates him, and as he creates him, he gives him a task to do, a job to do. And what's that job? Adam is tasked with overseeing the garden, with working the Garden of Eden. He has to name the animals. He has to be the caretaker. That's a lot of work. If you've ever been a care, caretaker of grounds, buildings and grounds is, is one of the, the big things here. If you've ever had that sort of duty, you know it's not a small task. And he had a big garden to oversee. And God looked at Adam and he says, oh, it's too great of a task for him to do by himself. He can't handle it. And not only can he not handle it by himself, but he has this isolation. God recognizes there's this isolation in Adam that wasn't good for him. In verse 18, God said in Genesis 2, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So the Lord then takes one of Adam's ribs. He creates Eve. He creates the wife and Adam calls her this. I love this phrase. He calls her, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. That right there, the world's first Valentine's Day greeting card. Right there. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. But do you hear it? It's actually a really lovely phrase. God joins them together in marriage. And as Genesis 2 says, they then become one flesh. The idea here is unity, this joining together where it's unified. Right from the start, we see that marriage is couched in a fundamental unity that is beautiful together. Adam doesn't see Eve as a lesser being. He is, she is not created to be his slave. She's not created to be underneath his feet. He, she, he is create, she is created, and he cherishes her. He, he sees her as his own bones, as his own flesh, because they are together, they are one, they are united. And so he loves her. And she, in return, thinks the world of him. There's this wonderful harmony. She doesn't nag him to pick up his socks when they've fallen on the floor. They're naked, so it doesn't really come into play here. But even if he did, have, she wouldn't have done that. And he doesn't turn around and nag or complain about her to his co-workers because she's his co-worker. But anyways, he wouldn't have done that anyways. This is a, in Genesis 2, we have the world's first fully functional, non-dysfunctional marriage. And to date, the only one. The only one that's ever been this perfect, where they don't abuse each other, where there's no struggle. But what we also need to note is that these two are assigned from the very beginning different roles. God gives each of them a different role, a different task to fulfill. For Adam, he is called to lead in the work of the garden and to lead in the relationship at home, to lead his family. Eve is given the task to be a helper in his rule, to co-rule over the garden. 
but they both have equal worth in the sight of God and in the sight of each other. There is an equality to their worth, but they have different roles. That's very important as we go forward in this. There's not a greater or lesser person. But this is why in Genesis 3, we see Satan come to who first? Eve. He's undermining the, the structure of marriage. He sees how God has created this marriage where the man is leading in the relationship. So Satan goes right to Eve to subvert this relationship. And so he, Satan figures, well, if I can drive a wedge between the husband and the wife, and I can drive a wedge between the people and their God, I can get sin into this picture. And you know what? It totally worked. It totally worked. That's why Satan goes to Eve first. He's subverting the marriage. And then we see that marriage almost instantly start to fall apart, start to disintegrate. The second they're caught in their sin, what do Adam and Eve do? They start pointing fingers at each other. He, um, Adam says, she gave it to me. And Eve's like, whoa, 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 is it to he? the serpent gave me all. They're, they're pointing fingers. They're saying they're not standing together anymore. There's not that unity. There's not that harmony and then God goes on to spell out what the curses of sin would cause in their life. And he says this to Eve. He says, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. What God's saying here is that this intimacy, this harmony of the marriage that they had had up to that point, now was going to be a power struggle. Now was going to be a battle of the sexes where both sides were going to be butting heads and trying to dominate each other. That was a model for a dysfunctional marriage. And now there's, there's problems here. This relationship's damaged. But is it damaged beyond repair? No. Because we know Jesus Christ comes in to repair relationships, to restore relationships. All of Ephesians, Paul has been talking about how Jesus has been repairing the relationship between God and man. Oh, he's been rebuilding that from the ground up, laying the foundations for our future re relationship with him. So it only makes sense that Paul would go on to talk about how Jesus is also repairing the relationships between married people that has been broken ever since Adam and Eve. So we must rejoice in that. Where there was once disunity in households, now there's a potential for harmony the way that Adam and Eve originally had. We can only start to fix and heal what is wrong in our relationships, not just marriage, but between us and our friends and us and our family and us and God, when Jesus Christ comes right into the center of it. When we invite him down, we say, Lord, I can't handle this relationship. My friendship with my best friend is suffering. My friendship with my husband or my wife is on the rocks. My, my mom and me don't see eye to eye. Whatever that relationship is, Jesus needs to come in. Only then can the relationships really start to be healed in a way that is lasting and true. Marriages are flawed until Jesus Christ comes into the picture. That's why if I perform marriage and two people, they don't know Christ, they're not Christians, I will preach to them because they need to hear that Jesus needs to be in that marriage. All right, so that's our foundation. So we return here to Ephesians 5, and I'm going to jump ahead, and I'm going to look right now at Paul's charge to the husbands. One thing that immediately should leap out at you is the, the wife section is this long, the husband section is that long. Husbands get three times as much space here, and that is because Paul is pounding into their heads that their responsibility in their relationship is greater. He really wants them to wake up and see that this, this civilization that had been abusing marriage and given the, the husbands this, I mean, they really, in that civilization, they were the tyrants. They had all these rights, and the women had no rights. And so he's saying, men, listen up. You need to take this seriously. You get into a marriage, this is what you need to do. And so what is the overarching command that Paul gives to the husbands? He says, you are to love your wives as you take up this mantle of a servant leader. Not just a leader, a servant leader. They are to love sacrificially. They are to love completely. They are to be tender and respectful. They are to cherish 
their brides. They are to love in such a humble, wholehearted state that there's absolutely no room for selfishness, just decisions that benefit their family as a whole. I actually think that these verses here have just as much a potential to be controversial because they strike at the heart of the male ego. The male ego says, it's all about me. And Paul says, well, when you get in a relationship, when you get into marriage, it's not anymore. It's not about you anymore. It says, when you get married, it stops being about you. It becomes about her. It puts her needs first. It puts her dreams first, her passions, her care, her protection. You love her. You have eyes for her. You don't have eyes for all these other women anymore. Just her, men. But that's not how a lot of marriages work in our world today. We don't have to go very far to find dysfunctional, broken marriages. We can turn on the TV and see it. We can look on the internet. We can look in the news. We can look next door. Some of us can look in our own homes. Marriages don't work perfectly. There was a couple in Oklahoma, and they woke up one night, and a tornado had torn off the roof of their bedroom, and they're looking up at the whirling sky, and the wife starts to cry. And the husband turns to her and says, it's not time to cry. Why are you crying? And she says, I'm just so happy. This is the first time we've been outside together in 10 years. <laughs> How many marriages suffer because a husband shirks his duty to lead and to care for his bride? I think when I see couples get married that day, they're all on fire for it. But what about 10 years from then? 20 years? 30 years? Men shirk their duties. I have lost count of how many women I see come into the church, sometimes by themselves, sometimes with their kids, but their husband is nowhere to be seen. Maybe on Christmas, maybe on Easter, but that's it. Because he's off sleeping in. He's off playing golf. He's off neglecting his duty to be a spiritual leader in his own household. His kids don't grow up seeing their dad reading the Bible and leading devotions and praying for them. You want to know who I think is one of the best husbands in the entire Bible? You probably never guess. Job. Job. Why? Because in Job chapter 1, we see that every morning Job would get up and he would go outside and he would offer a sin sacrifice to God for his family, for his kids, on the chance that they sinned and they had not repented. He would get up every morning and pray for his family. And, and when all that tragedy that we know very well in Job happened, his wife told him, Job, you need to curse God and die. And at that point, Job stepped up as the spiritual leader of his household, he said, no, I will not do that. Instead, he got down on his knees and he worshipped his God. Job was an amazing husband because he put his wife and his family before himself. He put his God before himself. He had no ego. He got over that. So remember, everything that Paul is saying here about the husbands also applies to a much greater extent to Jesus Christ and how he treats the church. As you're reading this, think about how our Lord loves us with the perfect and pure love of a husband to a wife. He has sacrificed everything for us so that we might be washed clean, made pure, holy, it says, radiant. I don't know, some of us guys are like, I don't want to be radiant. But yeah, you kind of do. Right? You want our sins washed clean. Even if you're not married, you can read these verses as God's love letter to you today. This is how Jesus Christ thinks of you. He's not like, oh, these people, they're, I've created them to be my slaves. I've created them to be my servants. No, he cherishes you so deeply, so wholeheartedly, that when he was on the cross bearing the wrath of God, suffering in a way that you cannot even imagine, his heart was for you. Because he would do anything for you. That's what a good husband does. And then we get to the wives. 
Then we get to these verses. You might be totally on board with a marriage being couched in unity, with a husband having to love his wife as he leads, love sacrificially, but we can't get over that word, submit. That's a hard word. That's a big pill to swallow. The weird thing is, we didn't have a problem with that last week. Last week, when we closed out our, our time, and I said how the church, Paul says right here, had to submit to each other, I had absolutely zero people come up to me after the service and said, I have a real problem that I have to submit to, to Dave over there. I have to submit to Carol over there. Nobody had a problem with that. Submission is not a bad word. It's been abused and misunderstood, but the way the Bible sees it, it is not bad in the least. It is a choice freely made to help somebody accomplish their goals, to su support them and put their needs above your own. That's what submission is. Saying, I want to help you accomplish your mission, and I'm willing to put your needs in front of mine. I'm making that choice on my own, freely. The vice president of the United States submits to the president in order to help him bear the responsibility of the office. She is not a lesser person in terms of worth. She has a different role than the president. An army sergeant submits to his or her lieutenant to help them bear the role of caring for the platoon, of leading the platoon. They have different roles but one person gladly submits in that. Even God submits to himself. This is true. This is weird, but it is true. The three persons of the Trinity are co-equal and co-powerful, but when it came to the purpose of redemption, the mission of redemption, the Son gladly submitted to the Father. We see this all through. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane? Not, your, not my will, but yours be done. That was the Son submitting to the Father. And the Holy Spirit submits for the purpose of redemption to the Son and the Father. The God practices a model of submission for the purpose of getting a mission done. So really, is it offensive for God to look at wives and says, Wives, if you love me, if you want to please me, Practice loving submission in your marriage. Practice helping your husband get his mission done. Submission is not slavish obedience. Submission is not sitting there in mute silence until your husband gives you permission to speak. It's neither one of those things. Rather, submission is a call to honor the husband's responsibility, the great responsibility God has given the husband to lead in his home to honor that and help him accomplish his God-given task that is too hard to do by himself. That is what submission is. She is to build up his confidence. She is to give him her support. She is to make him feel loved and accepted. These are all beautiful ways to submit. Now, there are limits to how much a woman is called to submit in a marriage. A woman is never to follow a husband into sin because Christ, not the husband, has true ultimate authority over a wife, just as Christ has true ultimate authority over the husband. If the husband is obeying God's call to a self-sacrificing servant leadership in his household, then the wife has absolutely nothing to fear in submitting to somebody who puts her needs first. You see, there's this back and forth, this beautiful way that it works together. But of course, that's not always the case, even in Christian marriages. And a lot of times we see marriages where the husband is failing in the duty and the wife feels torn in this call to submit. He says, well, he's not perfect. He's failing in his duty. He's failing in so... I, you, do you have all day? I could give you a list of how many ways he is failing. And then she struggles with that because God is still saying, but if you love me... Read these verses. If you love me, if you already submit to me, this is your calling and your relationship. And it's going to be tough. It's tough because us guys, we're not perfect. And some of us are more not perfect than others. Has anybody heard of Dr. Wayne Grudem? 
If you've never heard of him, he's a very famous theologian. He's actually one of the editors of the ESV Study Bible. He's alive today. And for 20 years, Dr. Wayne Grudem held a very prestigious position at Trinity University in Chicago. I mean, he worked alongside some of the greatest theologians of our current time, D.A. Carson, uh, Douglas Moo. He was right up there. People respect him so much. But a problem came along one day when Dr. Grudem's wife was diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is not curable, and it causes intense pain in your muscles. And it is exacerbated by humidity and cold, two things which Chicago has a lot of. So every winter she was suffering greatly, and that was always on Grudem's heart. But one year their friends invited them, they said, come down to Arizona for a week, just visit with us, and they did that. And Dr. Grudem said when they were there, he noticed how the, the heat and the dry climate pretty much made her pain go down to zero. And they were able to take their first bike ride in more than 10 years together. And so suddenly a thought started generating in his head. And he went back to Chicago, and as he went back, Wayne opened his Bible, and he looked right here at Ephesians 5.28. He said, well, if her pain was my pain, would I want to move to Arizona? And the answer was clear. Yes, obviously he would. And he discovered that in Phoenix there was a much much smaller seminary there, and he reached out to them, and they were flabbergasted that they could possibly get a man of his stature, and so they gave him a job offer right away. And so he went to his wife, and he said, I think we should move. And she said, no way. Don't you do it. Because she was looking at his prestigious position at Trinity. and says, this is such a step down in your career. Don't you dare make this sacrifice for me. And they went back and forth, as husbands and wives do. They're talking out the situation. He says, I want to move for you. She says, I want to stay for you. But ultimately, his wife said this. He said, I will follow your leadership in this area. And so they moved to Arizona. And that's where Dr. Grudem is now a uh, seminary professor. The wife submitted to the husband as the husband sacrificed for the wife and put her needs first. That is God's model for marriage. It is not offensive. It is so deeply beautiful because it's two people putting each other's needs first, loving each other so sacrificially, so wholeheartedly that they're cheering each other on. They want that marriage to function. They want it to work. The wife is bending to the husband in submission. At the same time, the husband is bending to the wife in love, and they make it work. They meet in the middle. Instead of two people jockeying for position, they come together, they intertwine, and they have harmony and unity. This is the end result of a functioning marriage that glorifies God. And it is a model of what God wants for the church and himself. We as a church bend to Jesus, and he, as our groom, has bent to us. He came down to earth for us. That was Christ bending. That was the groom coming down to sacrifice, to rescue his bride from the fires of hell and to make her pure and radiant and worthy of heaven. Ephesians says that God made us holy like the most glowing bride when we became saved. So if we love Jesus, we submit to him in our, in our marriages, but we submit to him also in our relationship with him. And we support this beautiful model of marriage that he has given to us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we look at how you have designed marriage, it's almost a little strange. It's very strange to us. As we look around at the world, we don't see this a lot. It's hard for us to understand. It's easy for us to just maybe want to throw it out, want to skirt around it. Lord, these are two incredibly huge roles with a lot of responsibility, a lot of expectations from you. Lord, I pray for the marriages here at Knox, the ones that are doing great, the ones that are not doing so great. Lord, come into those marriages. Help to strengthen our resolve as husbands and as wives to lead, to love sacrificially, to submit lovingly, 
to put each other's needs first, to call each other a bride and groom, to look at each other with love that just grows through the years instead of diminishes. Lord, I pray for those people who are really struggling in their relationship right now, may not know what the right thing to do. But Lord, I think that the right thing is always to look to you, always to invite you into that situation, always just to, to obey you in all things and trust that you will work these relationships out. Lord, for our church, for our community, for our relationship with you, Lord, we are your bride. We praise you. We thank you. We love you. Amen. Now receive the benediction from 1 Timothy. He who is a blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Go in peace. The groom loves you.